I first knew Leon uh, because I played guitar in the band of his wife, who was then called Mary McCrary. She was an artist on Shelter Records, which was uh, Leon's record company with uh, Denny Cordell. And um, uh, he was trying to promote her as one of Shelter Records acts. So in 1975, I think it was, uh, when they had these big summer jams that were in stadiums and such, they'd have 10 bands on the bill. Um, uh, uh, Leon insisted that if they wanted him, they had to take a 20 minute set of Mary McCrary. Uh, and so we would slip in uh, right before he played and play our 20 minute set, uh, at promotional set. And it was wonderful. Uh, uh, I got to know Leon and the members of his band, which at that time was the Gap Band uh, from Tulsa, of course, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. And um, uh, then uh, uh, Mary, of course, got to know Leon, too. They fell in love with her and eventually married. Um, but that's how I first got to know Leon. Uh, and then um, uh, eventually uh, there was one time where uh, Shelter was putting on a uh, promotional concert. They called it Shelter in the Delta. I guess it was in New Orleans. And so at this point, Leon and Mary were together. And so Leon uh, said, why don't, Mary, why don't you have your whole band stay at my house in Tulsa to rehearse for this gig? Uh, and, um, and so we did. And there would be parties every night. And uh, uh, I was such a nerdy guy. I knew all about synthesizers. And Leon had a little mini Moog there. And uh, he was so impressed that how I would play this thing. Uh, and, and knew how to program it. And plus, in the nights, I would use his wonderful studio to record my own music. He would let me do so. Uh, and so he saw that I did the recording engineer, and I was nerdy enough to know about all the recording equipment, and played some guitar. And so he, uh, once Mary was off the road, and they were living together in Tulsa, he offered me a job. Uh, and it was first just for recording engineering, but then finally, uh, I eventually proved myself to be good enough to play uh, guitar in his band when we would go out on the road. Uh, because even though I wasn't as good as the, the guitar players he normally worked with, I could uh, cop their parts pretty well. So it was a package deal. I worked at just mostly at Leon's home studio. And then sometimes I did some work at the church studio. Uh, but mostly I was just working with Leon or he would have some people come into the home studio, like the Gap Band um, and some other people too. Uh, so, um, yeah, there's mostly at the home studio. And it's funny, the 40-track machine, yes, he just loved uh, technology, and the bigger the number, the better. So, you know, at the time, the standard was 24 tracks of recording on two-inch tape, and uh, the Stevens Company uh, managed to squeeze 40 tracks on there. And, and Leon thought, well, that's good, I'll get one of those. And, um, but the thing is, is he also needed a 40-track console. Uh, so he bought this state-of-the-art console from the Automated Processes Company. But then, of course, he needed uh, Dolby noise reduction, so he bought 40 Dolbys. And, um, and it was kind of funny uh, because with a 40-track console, 40 Dolbys, and a 40-track tape recorder, there were always some technical problems, and they would end up just moving to the right. So you could never quite count on tracks sort of 37 through 40. Uh, that's, we would just move all the problems over to the end. Uh, and then, of course, um, when he decided he wanted to get another house in L.A., uh, he had to have another 40-track studio in L.A. So he bought a second Stevens 40-track, a second set of 40 Dolbys, and, uh, and then he had a console that uh, uh, was called Helios, uh, and then he, he had an outboard console on top of that. So but together they had 40 tracks. So he had basically uh, two 40-track systems. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of technical stuff to uh, keep working for the maintenance guy anyway. Of course, Shelter was always trying to keep things on a budget. And they had their offices in, in Hollywood uh, were basically this old house. Uh, and everybody would work in the various rooms in it. And uh, one of the ways they used to save money was something they called the Hathaway call. And uh, what they did is their phone bill... Um, they were always communicating with Shelter's office in Tulsa, and that was a long-distance call at the time. Well, they didn't want to have, and they, you, could get an, uh, a, 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 you could get a certain contract for discount for calling out or for calling in, but they didn't, or rather, for calling out in both places. They didn't want to pay for calling long-distance rates uh, for both places. So instead, uh, uh, they only paid it from outgoing calls from L.A. to Tulsa, 
And then, so if they needed a call back from Tulsa, they would place what was called a Hathaway call. So for example, let's say Don Williams was in Tulsa at the time. Well, uh, somebody would call and say, I'd like to, uh, 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 I'd like to call, uh, collect, I guess it was, uh, who would you like to speak to? I'd like to speak to Don Hathaway. Well, there were only one person with first names in the Tulsa office. So Don Hathaway was code for Don Williams should call back or if these the other direction, perhaps, Tulsa would call the LA office and then they would call back so they don't have to pay for the long distance charges in the one direction. And that was, of course, named after Donnie Hathaway, right? So I'm calling for Leon Hathaway. I'm calling for Denny Hathaway. I'm calling for so-and-so Hathaway. Well, you know, I, I, I sometimes joke about the fact that I went to the University of Leon Russell. Uh, I actually never uh, finished university and never got uh, any degrees. I have a high school diploma. Um, like a lot of people at, at, of my age, uh, you know, things were popping around the time of, say, 1975, and so I, I split and went off and did my own things, the music and such. Uh, but I learned a tremendous amount from Leon, um, and, you know, I was in awe of him. He was um, so uh, larger than life. And, um, and it, it, music came uh, to be second nature to him, uh, and it was not for me. And so um, when I worked with him, I learned so much. I learned about uh, music and production, um, uh, what to play, uh, what not to play, when, when to overplay, when to not overplay, um, attention and release, um, arrangement. And that's one of Leon's great strengths is he was... Uh, um, such a great arranger. In fact, he told me a story that once he was in uh, L.A. at a restaurant and uh, Bruce Springsteen was in the restaurant and he saw him and he came up to him and he paid, a, paid him a compliment and says, you're such a great band leader and arranger. Uh, and that's true. You know, he could put uh, the right people together and get such a, a tremendous sound. Um, and so uh, uh, I learned about that, but also he knew a lot about recording. Um, and uh, um, how to uh, fit things into the right uh, frequency areas. And for him, that was more, um, I think, intuitive for him. He was not a, a technical a recording engineer sort of person, but he just had so much experience in recording instruments. Uh, in fact, he told me a funny story once. He said that when he used to work with J.J. Uh, Kale, um, they would uh, uh, tr decide who was going to do knobs uh, for the session. You know, they didn't call recording engineers and says, Leon, you want to do knobs? No, JJ, you do knobs. So it was, um, uh, you know, something is secondary to the music. And, um, and Leon once told me, he said, uh, uh, because we were doing a recording, and I said, you know, I think we should do it again. I can get the sound quality better. He says, uh, he said, Raj, I come from the school of thought that, uh, that if it doesn't have any hum on the tape, it's a take. And so, uh, to him, the, the performance was far more valuable than um, getting a perfect recording. And in fact, that was so important to him um, to, uh, if you've got a good performance, even if the sound wasn't perfect, you can get the sound good enough. You can tweak it later on, but you can't change the performance. You can't, uh, there's not a, a, a knob for make a better musical performance. And so he was very uh, um, uh, good about that, about knowing what the right performance is. And, um, uh, and he used to, when I worked with him in the studio, uh, he would just let the, he wanted me to keep the tape rolling. For example, he would have somebody over, uh, one of the famous musicians that would come by to either the, the, the Tulsa home studio or to the LA studio. And he would say, I would be in the control room and he'd say, just let the tape roll. If it runs out, put another roll on. And it doesn't matter if we're wasting tape, just let it roll, because often uh, it's those rehearsals where the magic moment happened. And so um, I would try to be as, as um, uh, uh, clandestine as possible. And in fact, once in the L.A. house, the living room was the studio, and then the, um, uh, the control room was behind glass. And uh, we were talking about putting like hidden lavalier mics in the plants and things. So people could just be sitting around and playing and I could still capture this sort of stuff. I don't think we ever did that, but it was a fun discussion anyway. So I, I learned a tremendous, long answer to a short uh, question. I learned a tremendous amount from him about recording and, and sound and, uh, and, and just having access to such wonderful equipment that he had. So uh, it, it was a tremendous education for me and, and I was a, a very fortunate to, to have the experience.